a lot of what we experience in life, our sense of ourselves, our sense of the world around us, comes from our own construction, the things we put together. You might say that the present moment is a construction site. We're cobbling things together, and they fall apart, we cobble them together again. And it's only when we're in this activity that we really feel secure. Although part of us knows that it's pretty rickety and could change at any time, which is why we're constantly at it. When we come to concentration, we're going to take some of that apart. For instance, our fabrication around sensuality, all our thoughts and plans and everything. When you sit down with the breath, they have to go by the wayside. And for a lot of us, that's a lot of our identity and the pleasure we take in those things. So we feel a little bit out of our element. But if you can stick with, with the breath long enough and have a sense of well-being with the breath, you begin to say, well, this is actually very pleasant. And the pleasures you got from sensuality don't seem so important anymore. At least for the time being, they don't seem necessary. And some people find it easier to drop them, and other people don't. This is something that happens through all the different stages of concentration. Some people slip very easily from one level to the next, and others find that it's pretty wrenching and threatening, because there's some aspect of the way they construct things that they're very attached to. You see this as you move from the first jhana, where you're talking to yourself basically about the breath, about how things are going, into the second, where you stop talking. And there's some people who have a very strong sense that that's who they are, is the speaker in the mind, commenting on things. And just being with the perception, just the one word, instead of speaking in sentences and questions, you're just saying one word over and over, breath, 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 and focusing on one sensation. Then it can seem a little threatening, a little difficult. But if you can tell yourself, this is what the mind can do and it's going to have a good effect, that's when you get that quality that the Buddha calls internal assurance. You're okay with just that one perception. It's as if you've been walking along a street and all of a sudden find yourself on a tightrope. It's just that one perception, that one little line carrying you through. And it does help that holding that one line, you do create a sense of well-being in the body. Sometimes you actually have that sensation that's described in the analogies for the second jhana, which is there's an upwelling of energy. The, the blood is flowing freely. It feels good. And you don't have to do anything. In the image of the first jhana, there's the bathman who's working the water through the, the dough, mixing everything just right. That corresponds to the activity of directed thought and evaluation, where you're getting the breath comfortable and then you're allowing that sense of comfortable breath to permeate the body, working it through the different breath channels, working it through the different parts of the body. And you're actively doing something there. But as you move into the next another level of jhana, that you're not doing anything. It's just it's happening on its own. All the channels are opened up, and you feel refreshed. Another issue moving from the first to the second jhana is simply when it, the mind is ready to do this. Sometimes you work and work and work with the breath energies, and they just don't seem to be working well. There seem to be some blockages that you can't get past. You'll tell yourself, well, live with them. Settle down. See if you can hold on to this one perception. And sometimes the act of moving into the one perception opens up some other blockages. Things were kept tight and tense because you were talking to yourself. But if you can move to that sense of 
instead of talking in sentences, just repeating the one word or the one perception, breath, holding to one image, say, of breath. See what that does. Maybe it opens things up. You know, another issue some people have is with the feelings of rapture. Sometimes the sense of energy moving through the body gets overwhelming, gets stuck here or there. And here again, some people find it very easy and enjoyable, and other people really don't like it. So again, it's a matter of what you're used to, what you identify with. Especially people who are used to having to suppress their emotions and try to keep them under control. All this excess energy suddenly seems threatening. If they have certain blockages, suddenly there's pressure that builds up against the blockage. This is why John Lee has you work through the whole body from the very beginning, kind of opening up all the different channels so that when there is a release of energy, it doesn't get blocked. And it flows through the body and it feels okay. As for people who've had an experience of almost drowning, sometimes this sensation of fullness in the body feels threatening because it reminds them of the time they almost died. In that case, they have to hold in mind the perception that they are surrounded by air, they're surrounded by space. There's no water pressing in on them. And the fullness is purely an internal sensation. They're not being oppressed, they're not being stifled. But again, it's a matter of what ways of fabricating your experience in the present moment you really hold on to. You identify with very strongly, and which ones you don't. If it's something you identify with strongly, it's going to be hard. It takes a while to have the confidence to say, yes, I can let this go, and I'll be okay. Similarly, as you move to the third jhana, there comes a point where that excess energy it just gets really too much. You have to be confident that you don't have to rein it in. You can simply let it evaporate. All you have to do is move into a more subtle level of energy in the body, and it's there. It's like tuning your radio into a different radio station. You've been listening to heavy metal, and now you move to something more soothing. And this is a sense of fullness, a sense of ease, but it's very light, very easeful. The movement of rapture is gone. And it's a very subtle breath. The move to the next jhana can also seem threatening when you actually stop breathing. You might be in a state like this for a while and suddenly realize, wait a minute, there is no breath. And you can panic. You can think, whoops, I'm going to die. You've got that perception, you've got to keep pumping the breath in, pumping the breath in. Here again, you have to train yourself. It is possible to be here once the breath energy fills the body. And how it's explained in terms of physiology, I really don't know. Some people say that there's oxygen, oxygen exchange at the skin, other people say there is none. But it is possible to sit here and not have to breathe in and out. The breath energy fills the body. You don't feel any need to breathe. The only felt need is the mind's preconception. What's got to be done? If the body does need to breathe, it'll breathe on its own. You don't have to worry. And then the movement from that state into the state of space can also be threatening to some people or, or difficult. Because they realize, yes, the body is here, but they're going to be ignoring all the perceptions, all the sensations that tell them that where the skin is, where it's the line between your body and what's outside the body. And they feel a little unstable, just holding on to that perception of space, permeating the body, permeating everything outside. Here again, it's, some people really like that. Other people feel, feel unstable. So you have to look into it. where are you holding on? Some of these states require a very precise focus on exactly what perception you're going to hold on to and which perceptions you're going to let go.
And there's a part of the mind that realizes, look, I could leave this perception at any time and hold on to other perceptions. So it seems rather arbitrary. Why stay here? Well, the, the answer is that if you stay here, you learn something interesting about the mind that you wouldn't learn otherwise, as you f flit from perception to perception, kind of randomly. There's not that much that's learned, but when you hold on to one perception, whether it's simply the perception of the breath, the perception of the body not having to breathe, the perception of the boundary between the body and the space outside dissolving away. These are useful perceptions because they give you a chance to look at the way you fabricate your experience. And you're letting go of different aggregates. You're letting go of fabrication. You're letting go of certain perceptions. You're letting go of certain feelings. Letting go of the sense of the body. You can even work up to where you let go of the sense of the oneness of your consciousness. That's when you move from the sphere of the infinitude of consciousness to the sphere of nothingness, or the dimension of nothingness. It's that sense of oneness of the knower. You drop that. Now that's what's been holding you together all along, so it's going to be threatening. But if you have an explorer's attitude, that trying to figure out how you put things together, and which of those activities you can put aside. But the aspect that's really pleasant about this is that you've been engaging in lots of different activities. And it takes a lot of energy. And here you can learn how to let some of the things go. And not just wander around, you let them go very systematically. It's like playing pickup sticks. You pull out this stick and you pull out that stick and hoping that you're not going to collapse the whole thing. And you find that you can gain a sense of great stability even without all those extra activities. This is one of the reasons, or one of the ways, in which the practice of right concentration really opens up things in your mind. You begin to see, oh, I've been doing this, I've been doing that, and I have the choice to do it or not. I don't have to identify with it and say, I won't be able to live, I won't be able to survive without this perception or that way of fabricating things. It helps to lighten the burdens of the mind. At the same time, you gain some understanding to how all this stuff is put together. Realizing this helps to explain a question that often comes up when we read about the life story of the Buddha. You know, he studied with two teachers who taught him the dimension of nothingness and the dimension of neither perception and non-perception, and he realized that neither of those counted as the goal. So he left, subjected himself to torture for six years, self-torture, realized that that wasn't the path. So he cast his mind around, could there be another path? And he thought of a time when he was a child and entered spontaneously into the first jhana. Well, the question often arises, what well, wasn't he doing the first jhana under those two teachers? And there are places in the canon that say you can gain awakening based on the dimension of nothingness or neither perception or non-perception. So why couldn't he just go there, back to those old attainments, and gain awakening from there? And the answer, I think, lies in the fact that you can get into those very refined states in different ways. There's one sutta where the Buddha identifies three ways you can get to the dimension of nothingness, and a way you can get to the dimension of either perception or non-perception. In the case of those three ways, one of them basically is involves the insights that come from putting the mind through this step-by-step -step practice of going from the first through the fourth jhanas and then going to the dimension of space, the dimension of consciousness. And the fact that you've arrived at the dimension of nothingness, having gone through those stages, taking them apart, you're already primed to see things in terms of the different kinds of fabrication, the aggregates or the types of fabrication that are listed in dependent core arising. Whereas there are two other ways you should get in the dimension of nothingness, simply by repeating a mantra, two mantras that the Buddha gives. Both basically come down to 
Just there is no self. There's no self. There's nothing of me, nothing of mine. And holding that perception in mind, you can get into the state of nothingness. Well, you haven't passed through the other levels of jhana, and you haven't gained insight into different ways of fabrication. Similarly with the dimension of neither perception or non-perception, you can basically tell yourself, nothing will occur to me, I won't think anything at all, either inside or out, and you can get yourself into this state. But then you can hold on to it. That's what prevents it from being awakening. There's still the possibility of some clinging in there. You're clinging to the state of equanimity that comes up. And again, you cling because you haven't really learned how to take your mind apart. You've just badgered it into that state. So it's good when you're getting the mind into concentration. You realize there is right concentration that can help you understand the mind, and there are other kinds of concentration that actually get in the way. So remember, we're here to learn about fabrication, the way we put things together. And there are different ways of dropping some of those fabrications that you find threatening. Well, very carefully coax yourself and remind yourself that it is okay. And prepare yourself properly. I think John Lee's instructions for breath are really good that way. You open up the breath energy channel so that if any excess energy comes along, you can release it. It's not all bottled up. And you begin to get a sense that all the activities that you're doing to put things together and fall, seeing them fall apart and then put them together again and fall them apart, see them fall apart, you can begin to drop them. And you can have your choice as to when to engage in them and when not. Be, become more a master of your own mind. And you can go through life with a lot more lightness. Otherwise we burden ourselves immensely by the things we hold on to. We think that by holding on to them they're going to save us, but instead they pull us down. So if you learn how to let go in the right way and get us some confidence that, yes, the mind can be perfectly fine, not engaging in all the, say, the sensual fantasies that it had used to do, or dropping a lot of its internal chatter, or even getting to the point where you can stop breathing, it increases your sense of what's possible, it gives rise to a lot more understanding. and lifts a lot of burdens off your back. <clears throat>